Okay, we will continue with our schedule. Today is day three of the Ortus Developers Week. We have our third session of the day, last session of the day. Uh, please let the other developers know that we are here. Follow us on Twitter at Ortus Solution and use our uh, hashtag ODW2017. ODW, it's a free week long online conference led by the Ortus team and some community members. All sessions will be recorded and they can be found at ortusolutions.com slash ODW. You will be able to find our slides and some addition, additional material at slideshare.net slash ortusolutions. Why we do this? Because we love to give free training. We focus so much in education. This week is designed for you guys. And it's developer focused. We like to show our new products, new services, new projects, and we like to to get involved with the community and and we hope that you guys adopt to the new technologies. We are a professional open source. We offer training, support and mentoring plans, architecture and design sessions, server turning, security and setup, web development, and mariachi singing as well. Can you give us a little sample of that mariachi singing real quick, Javi? What does that sound like? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can be. You know I, we've all heard Jorge sing. If you've been into the box. Oh really? Oh yeah. I didn't hear that. <laughs> Watch out! If, if Luis tells you to come to Into the Box next year, it's a trick. He's going to get you on the mariachi band like he did Jorge. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> okay, so if you want to become an Archer's patron, you can help us becoming a sponsor of our open source development. That way we can keep our forgebox.io online. So it's a, a good way to help. And this is our schedule. Check for tomorrow's and Friday's schedule so you don't miss anything. And if you haven't got your tickets for next week, our CF Summit Restful Services Bootcamp in Las Vegas, you still have mm, a couple seats that can be uh, bought. So here we have the link and we also have a discount code, ODW2017. And it's gonna be a great opportunity to learn and to have fun with all of us in a nice suite. Also, next year in Houston, Texas, on April 25th to the 27th, we have our yearly Into the Box conference. So if you are interested of in being part of this, you should visit our website, intothebox.org to get more information. So go ahead, Brad, you can start talking about command box and task runners. Run, command box, run. Okay, here we go. All right, let's see here. <coughs> let's see which of my monitors actually get shared here. All right, do you see slides? Yes, sir. Right, this is the first time I've done screen sharing. I'm on this laptop with a second monitor. Okay, so I'm gonna get chat over here. Sweet. Okay, so I was just throwing together the last of these slides right before we started. So we'll see uh, if I've, how many hours worth of content I've packed into this hour. So <coughs> this is, um, on Command Box CLI, automating all things CFML, now with 100% more task runners. 
the task runners are, are somewhat new. I think they came out in a few minor releases ago back of uh, Command Box. And I won't spend too much time on the basics of getting Command Box up and running. Luis covered quite a bit of that in his session um, the other day. So uh, if you want me to stop and go back and show an example of anything, that's fine. Just yell in the chat. Um, I have a bunch of stuff I was going to cover here at the beginning, which aren't necessarily task runners, but they kind of just talk about some basic command box functionality. So um, I can stop and show any of it, but if I stop and show all of it, this will be like a seven hour session. Uh, so here's the about me slide, but since, uh, since Gavin skipped his, uh, his about me the other day, I, I thought I would just skip mine and instead I would do an about Gavin slide for you guys. Um, don't want to uh, have him get left out. So, uh, in case you guys saw Gavin's session the other day, this was the missing piece. He's a developer for Ortis. He's our content box evangelist. He's been using Cold Fusion for a long time. There's his blog. He also created CFML Repo. He's from Auckland, New Zealand, which is why he talks weird. Um, he's a cricket, soccer, tennis, and rugby phenom. He lives in California with, I think, 78 kids. Uh, one time I gave Tiger Woods golf lessons, and he can bowl a 300 game with his eyes closed. So there's your about Gavin slide for those of you who saw this session the other day. Hope your life is a little bit more complete now. Uh, by the way, all the, all the facts in that slide, I think, are correct, except for maybe those last three. So, <clears throat> hashtag free CFML. Um, CFML, in the past, was a templating language, specifically for just templating HTML. That's all it was good for, right? It was only usable inside of a web server behind IIS or Apache for web pages. Um, and you had to install the server along with all the other stuff you had to install. And you could only access um, Cold Fusion via HTTP in a web context. Today, that's not the case. Um, and specifically with the superpowers that Command Box brings you, you can run Cold Fusion or CFML anywhere that the JVM runs. So anywhere you can stick Java, um, you can stick CFML. Uh, and Lucy 5 supports JSR 223, which is a, a, a scripting standard that essentially means any other language that supports that, um, like Java, can run CFML directly from the net. Um, it can be used for embedded devices. You can run it from the command line, which is what most of our talk about today is. Um, and specifically, you can run it outside of a servlet container. And a servlet container is uh, Tomcat would be an instance, JRun was a servlet container, um, IBM WebSphere, JBoss, um, Wildfly, those are all servlet containers. Um, and so uh, with Command Box, you're actually running Cold Fusion or CFML, but it's not inside of the context of a servlet container. Um, and you can even run it on a Raspberry Pi. In fact, if you want to go take a look, um, sitting right behind my laptop right now um, is a Raspberry Pi that hosts pi.bradwood.com, uh, which is a site that runs on Lucy and uses content box CMS just for the fun of it. Um, and it's running CFML. So there's a lot of places that CFML can go um, nowadays that it, that it couldn't go in the past. Another example, if you've seen me at a conference uh, in the last few years, I have a hat that I've worn around with blinking LED lights and it's powered by CFML again in a Raspberry Pi using command box um, and uh, command line execution of CFML. So no web servers are involved. There's no IIS, there's no Apache, there's none of that nonsense. It's just uh, pure command line execution. So command box, if you've been living under a rock for the past three years or so, um, now I say that as a joke, but there's actually people who have never heard of command box. Um, so <laughs> uh, it is a native OS binary, runs on Mac, Linux, uh, Windows. Um, it's a command line interface. It has a REPL, which uh, stands for read, evaluate, print loop. Um, and it's command based. So all the functionality that you can do in command box is based around the idea of named commands. And that's mostly for your convenience. Um, it's also lightweight. It packs an entire CFML engine, namely Lucy, inside of it. And it's about 38 megs. Um, that's literally it. You can't even download the Lucy installer in 38 megs. Um, part of the reason we get it so small is because we use a library called Pack 200, which is like a uber Superman, Incredible Hulk zip format. It's pretty sweet. That's how we get it so small. Um, and it's extensible. Like Luis mentioned in the session every day, Command Box is written 90% or more in Cold Fusion itself. So you can hack around the core Command Box and you can write your own modules to extend how it works 
entirely in CFML. You don't have to learn Java or some other, uh, some other language. If you don't have Command Box installed, there's about 80 different ways you can get it. Um, apt-get, yum if you're on Linux, homebrew if you're on uh, Macintosh, or on Windows, you can just download uh, box.exe and toss it on your desktop. That's actually what I do on this laptop I'm on right now because I'm always testing different versions of it. There's a couple links on this page, and I'm going to show them uh, real quick. You want to familiarize yourself with the docs um, for Command Box. Uh, to download it or just find more about it, you can just go to ordersolutions.com. Uh, go to products and then click on command box and you'll find our homepage for command box and the docs are linked uh, well, there's a download link obviously right here at the top 3.8 is the current uh, stable version but there is a 3.9 release that I have in release candidate right now so that I'm looking for testing on uh, so there's a documentation link on this page this will take you to the docs um, however uh, it's not too hard to remember you can just go to command box dot uh, see if I can remember it right dot ordusbooks.com. Let's see if that's right. Yay, I remembered it. Right. So command box at ordusbooks.com is the uh, is the link to the command box doc. So um, if if you read everything in this uh, in this online documentation, um, you'll probably never have to ask for help. Um, but if you do read everything in here and you still have questions, you can always ask. But keep this on speed dial. Uh, this covers everything and there's an entire section um, in this called, where the heck is it? It's called Task Runner. There we go. There's a whole entire section on Task Runners, which is mostly what we're covering. So you want to keep that, that handy. All right, so um, uh, where's the link to the BE version? I am so glad you asked, John. Um, the easiest way to get the link to the BE version, because it's not easy to remember, is to use the um, the uh, oops the um, upgrade latest upgrade dash dash latest command. Um, I'm on the very latest um, uh, release candidate. Uh, if you're not already on the latest version, this uh, command will output the link for you to go to, um, and you can see it shows up here. This is our integration server where we run Jenkins. Um, so if you jump over to here, you drill down to order solutions. This isn't nearly as, as friendly, but this is kind of the, the backside of how it all works. And here you can see the 3.9.0.rc for uh, release candidate. So these are this is where you would get the downloads for the release candidate. Uh, I have a blog post that talks about this, and this is linked there as well. Um, so if I wanted Windows, which is literally what I downloaded like two minutes before we started the session, um, I would get this command box win 390. Okay, so um, I want to cover just a few things. Uh, some of these Luis talked about in his other sort of more general command box session. Um, but I'm going to build upon these as we work our way up to task runners, and then we'll spend some time on task runners. So command box has a REPL. And that stands for read, evaluate, print, loop. Um, I just like to show this. Uh, Every major programming language in existence for like 10 years now has had a REPL. Uh, Cold Fusion was really late to the game and it's kind of an odd thing for people that are just used to writing, you know, old school procedural Cold Fusion to make web pages. You're kind of thinking like, why would I want to run, you know, Cold Fusion from the command line? Um, what a REPL lets you do is just write, uh, write CFML one line at a time and it just executes it as you write it. This is using the script version of CFML, so you can do anything you want, you know, uh, one plus one right, outputs two, you can set variables, A equals three, B equals five, we can do A times B, outputs 15. Uh, basically anything you can pass, uh, or anything you can write in ColdFusion script, you can do in a single line. You can even uh, create some uh, complex variables, like I can create an array called fruit. Um, member functions come in really handy um, from the REPL, I can append. Um, an apple into the fruit. Every time that I, I run a line of code, you can see it outputs the uh, the array at the bottom, pin an orange. All right, so you can manipulate uh, variables. You can also just call functions like now, right? So uh, the REPL actually can come in pretty handy. If you're ever sitting in front of your computer and a coworker walks up and says, you know, hey, how does the hash function behave, or the list last function, or, you know, whatever, you can just like, you know, pop open the, the command box REPL and you can just try it. You can bang away a few functions, see what they do. Um, and when you're done, you can just, you know, exit back to the shell. So uh, the REPL is kind of handy. Um, and just to reiterate, there's no Cold Fusion server running 
or started in the typical context on my computer. In fact, on this particular laptop, I didn't even have Cold Fusion or Lucy or anything installed. All I have is Command Box. So uh, the CFML execution is happening purely from the, the command line. All right, so REPLs doesn't have much to do with task runners per se, but I just wanted to lay some groundwork for some of the stuff that um, Command Box does, because some of this we'll be able to leverage. Um, you can uh, dip down into your native shell inside of Command Box, and you can run um, native executables. Obviously, this is going to tie you to whatever operating system you have going on. Um, but from uh, Command Box, you can just proceed an exclamation point, um, and then the name of the, uh, the command you want to run. So uh, I'm currently on my desktop. If I do exclamation point dir, I'm actually going to run the Windows directory command from inside a command box. It's going to proxy that output um, into the shell. So anything that I can run, like a Java dash version, right? I can run this in DOS on Windows, and I can run it inside of my command box shell with this little exclamation point. Now you might be thinking it's kind of dumb. Why don't you just open up a DOS window? Well, you can do that, but um, the point is you can create task runners and recipes and commands in command box um, that in the middle of some cold fusion execution can quickly and easily uh, dip into your operating system, run some binaries. Uh, this is like CF execute. Uh, it's just way better than CF execute. Um, the second little, uh, little fun trick you can do is you can actually run uh, CFML functions from the command line. Uh, you simply type the name of the function and proceed it with a hashtag or a pound sign. And you leave off the parentheses. Uh, so sitting here at the at the command box shell, if I do um, hashtag now, it actually runs the now function, which for what it's worth is literally the same as passing the now function into the REPL. It's just really all it's doing behind the scenes. Um, that can lead to some interesting mashups. Um, if you want to, you know, hash something from the command line, um, we can just run the cold fusion hash function and we can treat it as over a command and we can hash the password, my password right here from the fly, um, on the fly. I didn't even have to dip into the REPL and I can do this inside of a, inside of a recipe or amongst some other commands. Um, some really handy stuff for some of these other string manipulation things that cold fusion has. Um, like I can call the, uh, the reverse cold fusion function and I can pass in ABC and it's, ooh, I missed a hashtag, sorry. Pound sign reverse, there you go. Right, and you get back CBA. Um, also things like uh, list, list get at, list manipulation um, can be kind of handy. In this instance, uh, I can't copy and paste, I exported my slides as PDF. Uh, in this instance, uh, I'm taking www.foo.com using list get at to get the second item in the list, piping that into the cold fusion uppercase function and piping that into uh, the CFML reverse function. So it would output oof in all uppercase. Um, so you can do some fun kind of mashups that uh, bring CFML's functions up to the, the CLI as sort of first class citizens. Um, and that's kind of handy. Um, there's another thing called expressions. Uh, these are really just expansions is what Bash calls them. Uh, if you look at these uh, examples here, everything that is uh, surrounded by these backticks is run as a separate command. So server start name equals, and then inside of back ticks, I have cat default server.txt. This would read the contents of the default server.txt file, and the contents of that file would become the name parameter for server start. Um, that can be kind of, uh, kind of handy as well for mashups. Um, here you can see uh, this, this third example here would be setting a uh, property in your box.json called created date. And the value of that property would be the output of the CFML now function piped into the date format function with a uh, particular date applied. Um, so without having to create any CFM files or even drop into the REPL, uh, you can actually do some on the fly execution of CFML functions um, from the command line. Okay, and uh, here's a cool example of a mashup. Um, this runs the forgebox show cold box command, which returns um, details about the cold box package, uh, forge box show cold box. Please wait. Uh, look at this nice formatting. This is new in, in command box 3.9. Do some basic markdown formatting now. All right, so here's the, uh, here's the, the, the cold box package. Uh, we're using the JSON flag, so we're getting back, um, oops, clear. We're using the JSON flag, so, Forgebox show 
uh, Cobox. So we're getting back all that information as JSON, right? And then um, you can pipe it into some cold fusion uh, functions and actually uh, dig out. In this instance, we're getting the latest version of Coldbox. Uh, let me just type it again since I can't copy and paste it. Uh, so all that JSON piped into struct find, and I'm getting the uh, version struct, and then we're gonna pipe that into, actually that's an array, so version's array. Pipe that into the CFML array first function, it's getting, the output's getting smaller and smaller as I go. So here is uh, the struct that, represent that represents the latest version. And then we can pipe that into struct find again and get out the version key. So there you go. So 5.0.0 hyphen snapshot. That is the latest version of the cold box package. Uh, so just an example of how you can kind of combine um, commands and, uh, and CFML functions for some nice little one-liners from the command line. Oakley dokley. Um, I won't show this unless anybody wants to, um, because task runners supersede this in, in functionality. Um, but you can also execute just raw CFM files from the command line. And um, it just looks like, you know, execute test.cfm or whatever you want the CFM file to be named. Um, this works and it works pretty well, but it's fairly basic. It doesn't have good support for parameters or any of the things that task runners give us. Um, so I'm gonna mention that it's possible, but I'm not gonna dig into it unless anyone's just dying to see an example of it. Um, another similar example, if you're cool enough to be on a Unix-based operating system, um, are shebang scripts. This works the same essentially as execute test at CFM, except for this uh, brings CFML up as a first class um, executable scripting language by your operating system. So if we had a file called myscript.sh, uh, the extension can really be anything you want. Uh, Unix doesn't care. And if this were the contents of the file, um, hash bang, user bin environment box, and an output um, now, then you could uh, chmod that script to be executable and you could execute it as just um, dot slash my script and it will run it. Um, that's pretty cool, uh, namely because you don't even have to reference box at all. Um, you just tell the operating system, I would now like to execute the script. And based on the shebang at the top of the file, your uh, you know, Linux or Unix um, says, hey, I will use this box binary to, to execute this. Um, so that's pretty cool. We also have the ability to create custom commands and we're almost to task runners. These, these are the prelude to task runners. So custom commands <coughs> um, are registered into the default namespace inside of uh, command box. If you use the command box help, we can see that there's a whole uh, list of sort of top level commands built into command box um, that, you know, uh, constitute the basic shell. We can see there's a whole list of nested namespaces um, like cold box. So if I do uh, cold box help, you can see that there's uh, further namespaces like cold box create. Um, and the cold box create namespace has a whole bunch of commands. So there's always commands that ship out of the box or command box, but you have the ability to extend those with um, command box modules. And examples of that would be uh, cfconfig, uh, which I wrote, cfdocs, which Pete Freitag wrote, uh, docbox, which I think Luis and I wrote, uh, cfscript.me, this is pretty freaking cool. This will convert your tag-based CFCs into um, script-based CFCs. It's actually really sweet. Um, uh, Pete Freitag did that one as well. Image to ASCII generates ASCII art off of images, um, and you install them as install and then the slug. Um, this works really well. The biggest downside is that you need to package your commands up um, inside of a module, and you need to publish, you need to host them somewhere, like a GitHub repo, and then you need to publish that package to ForgeBox um, so then someone can install your module into their local command box installation. I make it sound like that's like hard to do. It's not actually hard. Um, it's actually fairly easy to do. But if you just have like a sort of ad hoc, you know, build that you just want to create and you just want to be able to run it or just give it to somebody and say, here, run this, um, you may not care to package that up as a, as a module um, to be a, a first class command. So this is where we finally end up, which is task runners. Task runners give you um, the flexibility, everything you can do with a custom command, which I didn't talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it here in the context of task runners. So you can do pretty much everything you can do with a custom command, um, but 
it's just a single CSC. It's not a folder of code. It's not a module. There's not a box.json. There's no forge box involved. It's just literally a CSC on your hard drive or in your repo or wherever you want it. So it's uber portable. Um, you can just copy that CSC anywhere you want, point command box at it and be like, go run that thing. And command box will go run that thing. And it's all the power of a custom command, um, but without the, the boilerplate of the module. So if there's no installation. You don't need to install it in the command box. You can literally just ad hoc run them anywhere and everywhere you please. Uh, so it's easy to distribute. You could, you know, like literally attach this to an email and send it to a coworker and say, hey, here's a quick task runner I wrote that will, you know, I don't know, defrag your hard drive or something. Uh, just, you know, save this off the email and, and run it with command box. Um, you can also have, uh, you can have more than one target in your CFC file. Uh, if you're familiar with how Ant works, um, and it's an XML-based um, build tool, uh, you can have multiple targets in one file. Uh, and it's sort of the idea is to replace other build tools like Ant or just shell scripts or things like Grunt, which are built on Node. Um, and again, if it's not obvious, this doesn't require any server to be started. This is uh, pure CLI execution. So features of task runners, and some of these are actually most of these are features of custom commands um, as well, are there's very little boilerplate, very little. Uh, it's pure CLI execution of CFML. Uh, no web servers are involved. The only thing you need to have installed is the box binary. Uh, Built-in parameter handling. Um, and that's if you want to have a task runner that, that you know, zips directories or accesses the database and does some jobs, but you want to be able to have it be parameterized, um, you get all the power of, of command boxes, parameter handling. Um, CLI interactivity with the user. Your task runners can ask the user questions from the command line um, and accept answers that will affect how they run. That's not something you're typically used to doing in Cold Fusion. Usually, you know, your cold fusion websites just, you know, run all the code in the CFM or the CFC file from top to bottom, and then the user, you know, loads a web page when it's done. Uh, since we're executing, you know, on the fly here from the command line, you know, the script can stop halfway through, ask the user in the command line, you know, answer a question for me, and then continue on executing as soon as they, um, as soon as they answer that question. You have ANSI color formatting, so you can do nice, pretty, uh, colors and formatting to the extent which the ANSI standard allows, um, which isn't anything amazing. You get like eight colors, but uh, it's built in. Um, access to things like file globbing and directory watchers. If you don't know what the heck file globbing is, you've probably used it and didn't realize it. Um, that's whenever you use things like an asterisk to refer to all the, fi all the files in the directory or a question mark to uh, have a placeholder. Um, in a in a in a directory path, uh, that, that's referred to as file globbing. Um, you can also dip down on those uh, those commands and native operating system binaries we were looking at on some of the previous slides. You can run those um, from within your task runners very easily, which is kind of why I showed those. And then of course it has some really nice helpers to output um, text of the user. Your task runners may or may not have any output at all. They may just you know hit a database and get some records and loop over them and do some stuff, um, or it may be something you want to have output. So the world's simplest uh, task runner would look like this. Uh, it would be a, a folder, I'm sorry, a file rather, tasks.cfc. Inside of it, you would have a component defined and you would have a function defined called run. And we would say print green line, hello world. It doesn't have to be green, it could just be print line, but green line will, will show up as green. We'll talk about that print helper. Uh, this is sort of the world's simplest task runner. Um, the, really the only boilerplate in here is the component tag and the run function. Um, if you really, 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 really want to do this in tag-based cold fusion, yeah, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> but I do everything in script. Uh, and to run this, you would simply, um, from the same directory that that task TFC existed, you would type task run. Um, and you would see the output hello world. Task run is a command in command box. Uh, we can view its help right here. So the task run command is what you want to uh, use anytime you want to run a task. So super easy to get started. Um, if any of you guys listening have command box installed already and you want to follow along, you could basically create this example in like 20 seconds or maybe 30 seconds depending on how slow you type, right? Just a CFC in a folder, 
It's a component, it has a function called run, and you type task run. So unlike custom commands, task runners are not integrated into command box, they're not registered, they're not installed. Um, if, whoa, I just hit a key that went all the way to the end of my slide deck. Let's go back to the top. Um, so, you know, if you use the built-in help commands and command box, you're not gonna see any references to your task runners. These are fully ad hoc. Um, you just, you know, CD into the directory where the CFC exists and you say, hey, run this task. Um, and if you make changes to the CFC file and you type task run again, you'll see the new version run. So let's break this down. The default file name is task.cfc. <clears throat> the default method or target, as I call it, is run. But you can call them whatever the heck you want. That's just the default. So if you type task run in a folder and you don't provide any other parameters, it's going to look for a file called task.cfc. It's going to look for a method called run. If it doesn't find those, it's going to yell at you. Uh, if you created a, full, a file and called it mytask.cfc and it had a run method, you could use this first example, task run my task. So you could have a, a whole folder full of different tasks with task runners or different names. Um, and if instead of naming the function run, you name the function my target, then you could say task run my task my target. So that would look for a CFC called my task.cfc, and it would run the function inside of it called my target, right? Um, so for simple one off standalone, easy tasks or builds, you can use the defaults. If you want to get all kinds of fancy, uh, you can do whatever you want. So let's talk about parameters. How do you pass things into? Um, your task runners and yell at me if you want me to stop and, and demo what any of this. Um, I can I can show this stuff, uh, but maybe we'll see if we get through the slides otherwise. But uh, to define parameters, um, this works the same as commands do. Um, you just simply declare parameters to your function, right? So your run function or whatever you've decided to call the function. Um, so in this instance, I have a uh, pram one, a pram two, and one called force. Right, uh, so all the, this is just CFML code. So all the, all the regular CFML stuff applies here. You can make parameters required. Um, you can specify data types, which will be enforced just like it normally would. So I can say force is Boolean and I can give it a default value of false. Um, so this is just the same standard cold fusion that you write day in and day out. Uh, there, there's nothing new or special to learn here. Um, if a parameter is marked required, and the user does not supply it as of command box 3.9.0 release candidate, uh, they will be asked to provide that parameter. In command box 3.8, it'll just throw an error and say, hey, you didn't give me that parameter. Uh, so that's all you have to do to uh, d declare parameters. And you'll access these inside of your run method, just like you would any other cold fusion function. They're just in the argument scope. There's literally nothing special about it. They're just arguments to the method. And command box takes care of parsing the command line and turning that into an actual method invocation for you. So when you call your task runners, um, in the same way that the command box handles everything else, you can supply parameters uh, as named or positional. I'm really, uh, I really like named parameters for task runners, and that's just because it's more self-documenting. So this is kind of a, my personal preference. Um, any parameters that you're passing to the actual task are going to start with a colon. And you can also pass in flags, but again, they need to have that colon. And the difference is um, we're separating out the parameters that are being passed to the actual task run command from the parameters that are just being passed through to your actual task runner. So an example of positional parameters would be um, task run, task.cfc, my targets run, value one, value two. Uh, the catch with positional parameters is you can only use them if you specify the, uh, the CFC file and the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, and the, the target. Otherwise, um, your value one and value two would be mistaken for those first two parameters, uh, which is another reason why I like this go ahead and name everything. Uh, I did this also just to show the .cfc is optional. You can leave it on there, you can take it off, command box will figure it out. So to do this with uh, name parameters, which allows me to, uh, to leave out the, the CFC file and the target since I'm using the defaults, it would be colon param one equals value one, colon param two equals value two. 
right? And these these will be passed along and sent into the actual task CFC when it's executed. And of course, the flags uh, look very similar to any other flag you've seen in, in command box, except for we stick the colon in the front of it, and that tells command box that this force flag is being passed along to the actual task runner. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'll assume everyone's asleep, not paying attention, or this makes perfect sense. So task runner output. We have a handy um, helper, which is actually a CFC instance, um, and it is called print. Um, I didn't discuss this. Let me back up. So th this is our task runner, right? It's a CFC. Um, this CFC doesn't extend anything. You see that? There's no extends equals. Actually, it does. All of your task runners via the voodoo magic of Wirebox automatically extend a special base component and therefore have access to a whole bunch of helper base methods and, uh, and variables. And you don't have to do anything for that to work. It's just the, the special magic that command box does for you. So whenever I'm saying uh, use things like this variable called print, you might be thinking, where the heck does print come from? It comes from that special base class that we extend automatically. Um, this is all documented, so don't worry. It's not like you know, crazy voodoo magic that you don't know what it's going to be. It's all in the docs, and uh, you're more than welcome to just open up the code inside of command box, um, and you can just take a look at all the methods that are in there. But there's nothing in there that's not in the docs. So uh, print is a CFC instance, and we can call methods on it um, and chain them together. Um, the cheat sheet would be the docs, John. Like I said, there's nothing in there that, that aren't in the docs. Um, so print line, I like spam. That'll output a line of text to the console and it will have a line break at the end of it. Uh, print line by itself would just output a line break. Um, print red line uh, would output the text in the color red. Um, print blue text would output it in the color blue and it would not have a line break at the end because it doesn't have the word line. Um, and this print helper uses on missing method um, to dynamically parse the method names you type on the fly. So you can actually get really crazy with it if you want to. There, there is no like list of all the possible things you could do. Uh, so check out this example. There's a couple things I'm doing. First of all, I'm chaining all these methods. You'll see I only have print once. I only have one semicolon. This is all one statement. And I'm just printing out a whole bunch of different lines by chaining these calls because each of these methods return the print helper. So you get nice and readable. So print, uh, red on white lines. That would be red text with a white background. Uh, print bold red on blue text, right? So it's going to be bold, it's going to be red, um, and there's going to be a blue background. Um, empty lines. Uh, look at this one, I like this one. Bold blinking underscored blue text on red background. That is totally valid and it would do exactly what it says. Um, Indented is also a keyword. If you say uh, print indented line, it'll uh, automatically put a couple line, uh, not line break, spaces in front of it. That can be handy for uh, some of the output. And then this last little special method to console, this is the equivalent of the CF flush tag, um, but to the CLI. So if you're doing a command that's looping over a large list of files or database records, and you wanna say like, you know, uh, file one processed, file two processed, but you want the user, the person running the task runner to get immediate output, um, you, can, you can tag on to console and that'll flush everything you've printed out to the screen immediately, um, which is, is just great if you have a, ta a task runner that might take 15, 20 seconds to run and loop over a whole bunch of files, it can output you know, status as it executes. So that to console is sort of your CF flush equivalent. All right, any questions on, on the print helpers? Um, we can play around with these if you want. They're, they're fairly uh, self-explanatory. Um, and the docs show you all the possible color names you have to choose from, um, as well as the uh, special words like indented or line uh, that are looked for in the names. Okay, not doing too bad on time. So task runner interactivity. Uh, so there's three main methods we can use to interact with the user. Uh, the first one is the ask method, and again, this comes from that base class that all task runners magically extend, um, and it's in the docs. Um, we, ca we pass in to ask the question we want to ask the user, and whatever they type in and hit enter, that will be placed into the variable. It's returned from the ask function. So if we say var color equals ask enter favorite color, um, the, the execution of a task is going to stop. It's going to output 
enter your favorite color to the screen. It's going to give the user a cursor. They type in purple. They hit enter. The task will continue executing, and the variable color will contain the text purple, right? So you can use that to ask the user um, anything and anything you want. You can make wizards where you ask the user a series of questions. Um, uh, the sky is really the limit. There's also a variation of ask called confirm. Um, confirm doesn't return text, but it returns a Boolean. It always returns a true or false. And so um, typically you'll use the confirm function inside of an if statement. If confirm, do you agree, then do something. And confirm is fairly liberal. It will take Y or yes or true um, all as positive you know, responses. It'll take in or no or false or anything else that's just gibberish will all be false, right? Uh, so confirm is very handy if you want to, you know, uh, are you sure you want to overwrite this file kind of thing. Um, and then there's also a, a wait for key function. I don't use this one too much, um, but that function will pause until the user just presses any key on their keyboard and it'll hand you back the ASCII code uh, for the key that they, uh, that they did. Dang it, I just, I don't know what, what I just hit, but I just went to the end of my slides again. <laughs> um, there we go. So uh, wait for key is, uh, I made that function back, whoa, that's messed up. I need to look into that. I think it's some weird formatting going on. Uh, when I made the snake game in command box, and you sit here and you use your number keys to control it. Uh, that uses that wait, wait for key function. Okay. So that's interactivity. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can do there with that, um, especially if you want to ask ask things of the user. Um, there's some nice integrations with the shell. Uh, all of these things are available for you to call git cwd. Will get you the current working directory that you're in. Um, so this is an, this is analogous to like running the the print working directory command. So if you uh, called that git cwd function from inside of a task runner in this folder it would get C users Brad desktop or wherever you were currently running. Uh, there's a shell object that has some handy things in there. Um, shell.clear screen. If you want to wipe out all the, the output on the screen, shell.get term width, get term height. That'll give you in characters, the width and height of the um, current terminal window, which can be kind of handy if you want to do some cool little ASCII tables or something like that, and you want to know how wide the, the user's current shell is set to. All right. So, <clears throat> run another commands. This is where it really gets good. So anything that you can run from the shell and command box, like you know the command box version command, you can run from inside of a task runner. So there's really nothing you can't run from anywhere at this point. Um, so inside of your cold fusion code and to be clear the the code here on the screen would go inside of your run function or whatever you've named your target uh, there's a special function called command and this uses a design pattern called the uh, command actually <laughs> it's ironic uh, the command uh, design pattern um, and it's a, a chainable DSL so you pass in the name of the command you want to run like version and then you chain to it dot run and that'll be that that is the exact same thing as running the version command from the shell. It's just that we're, we're doing it from inside of the CFML and your task runners. Any of the output from the version command will be flushed out to the screen by default. You can capture it into a variable if you want to. Uh, so here's all the possible um, things you can chain into this uh, command DSL. Uh, you can uh, specify the parameters you want. You can specify flags, which is sort of a specific instance of a parameter. Um, append and overwrite are the equivalent of uh, the right bracket and double right bracket from the console. Um, you can specify the working directory that you want the command to run in. Commands like, you know, box install obviously are uh, our current directory aware, you know, to behave differently based on the directory. Uh, so you can you can tell command box where you want that directory to be, 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 where you want the command to be run if you don't want it to be run in the current working directory. Um, you can also pipe the uh, the output of the command into another command, and then of course uh, you always end with that dot run at the end. So this is uh, this is super powerful. Some more examples: um, if you wanted to run the uh, copy command, you could run cp, pass in the two paths, 
um, you might be thinking, well, you know, why wouldn't I just use the, the you know, the, the directory copy or the file copy functions that are part of Cold Fusion? And the short answer is, yeah, you can do that. Um, I mean, it's up to you. Um, you know, the CP command might have some nice special stuff like file globbing that, you know, the CFML directory copy function doesn't. So there might be a good reason why you'd want to go ahead and just, you know, run command boxes copy function right from CFML. Uh, this would be an example of installing something in a task runner. Uh, command is install. We want to pass the first parameter in as, as cold box, and we can pass the force flag and the no save flag. Right, so that would install command box forcefully into the current working directory. Um, so you know you can you can use a task runner to maybe help you know do some default setups for you know a developer's local you know workstation. Maybe you could use it to install some of the you know some of the modules you wanted them to have. Um, and of course, since we can mash up pretty much anything, um, I showed you guys earlier how you can do um, the uh, exclamation point, and then you can dip down into your local op uh, your local operating system. Um, the exclamation point is just a shortcut for this run command. It's the exact same thing, right? Run just means run on my on my native operating system. So we can do the same thing in a task runner. I can say I want to run the run command, which means delegate to my operating system, and I want it to run my Java local Java binary with dash version, and it's gonna run that from inside of your task runner. So you can also run native um, executables, and uh, this is better than um, better than CF execute um, in several ways. Uh, first of all, if you have interact interactive commands, it actually works. Um, second of all, it's working directory aware, unlike CF execute. Thirdly, it actually uh, passes it through the local shell, so the CMD, or bash, um, unlike CF execute. Uh, so there's actually like seven different ways why the run command would be desirable over just using CF execute. Okay. No, James, I'm not aware of any feature that allows you to do that. Uh, we use process builder behind the scenes. And from my understanding, um, well, let me take that back. Um, on Windows, I believe if, from what I've read, I've never tried it. If you run a net use command, um, and then you run whatever it is you want, supposedly it'll run out of that user. Otherwise, it just runs under whatever user box is running. But you'd, ha you'd have to try that. I've, honestly, I've never tried it, but I did Google it once because I was curious. Um, but there's, there's no way in Java um, to say, run this native binary and use this user. From what I found, you just have to run net use and then turn around and run the thing you want kind of weird but okay so error handling uh, you may want to have a task runner that does some you know some validation or you know has some pretty messages that says to the user um, you know hey uh, I can't do that thing you asked me to do because I'm expecting a file to exist and it doesn't exist um, you can just return from the from the function if you want that's fine um, you can also just throw an error if you want but throwing an error is kind of uh, it's kind of messy as far as the amount of output that's generated uh, so we have a nice function available to you called error um, and you can just pass the error message you want uh, that'll raise a special type of exception which firstly will halt the execution of a task uh, but secondly we'll have a little bit prettier um, command line output um, and it's sort of the, uh, the recommended way of raising um, kind of an expected error inside of a task runner. Also, um, and this is actually the most important reason why you'd want to do this, when you run this error function, the exit code from the, uh, the box process will be set to one. Uh, so if you're doing this as part of like a Jenkins build or a Travis CI build or any kind of build in which it actually, it'll fail, you know, if the um, if the exit code comes back as saying something bad happened, then you'll want to use this uh, built-in error plumbing because uh, that'll return the the appropriate exit code that you want. So if, if your task runner wants to, you know, talk to the 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 process that called it and say, you know, I failed, um, then yeah, can try catch be used? Uh, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is for what? Um, like I said, the error, this error function actually does a, a throw inside of it of a certain type. So you can 
try catch it if you want to, but I'd need to I'd, I need to know what specifically you're asking about, Misha. All right, while I wait for you to type, um, let's move on. So, database access is perhaps one of the most compelling uses of um, of task runners. All right, sorry, Misha, you said safe handle error and exit. Oh, do you mean like, can you use like this try catches in your task runner just to wrap arbitrary logic of your own? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just cold fusion code. Anything you can write in CFML, you can put in a task runner. So if you want to write a try catch in your task runner, man, go for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're going to like try to delete a directory and maybe the directory is locked and you want to handle it in a nice way, yeah, I mean, wrap the sucker in a try catch and the try catch, you can, you know, you can do a safe, a safe exit. Yeah, all, all that, all that's available to you. It's just, just CFML like any other code you'd write. Okay, so, um, you know, it's funny, this t slide title says Access Database, but no, I'm not talking about Microsoft Access. I'm talking about accessing a database. Um, the, uh, the quickest and easiest way to access um, a database uh, from a task runner is probably in this manner. And like I was just saying, um, database access, I think is one of the most compelling uses for task runners um, because a lot of other stuff you can do in task runners, you could do in a shell script or in a batch file or in PowerShell. Um, but those solutions would not at least be easy for you to access um, a database, to run some queries, to loop over uh, result sets, uh, at least not nearly as easy as Cold Fusion would make it. Uh, we're Cold Fusion developers. We're used to running SQL statements easily on a database, looping over it, doing things. Um, and task runners allow you to do that, um, but from the command line. So uh, the code on my screen will work on Lucy. This will not work on Adobe Cold Fusion because this is a Lucy feature. But that's okay because task runners run inside of the command box CLI, which is powered by Lucy server. Um, so you can use uh, syntaxes that are Lucy specific, uh, like leave off your semicolons, all that uh, good nonsense, and you can totally get away with it because all your task runners are going to run inside of Lucy. So in this instance, we're using Query Execute, and you may be wondering, well, will Query Execute supported in Adobe Cold Fusion? What's Lucy specific? Um, the option here, data source is normally the data source you pass in is a string. It's the name of the data source configured in your um, web-based administrator, right? So data source equals my DSN. Um, in this case, we're not passing a string, we're passing in a struct. The DS variable is defined up here as uh, a struct literal, and it is an on-the-fly declaration of a data source. And this is important because uh, the, the Lucy engine that's embedded inside of the command box CLI doesn't have a web-based interface. There is no admin you can log into. This isn't a web server, this isn't a website, there's no web anything, there's not even a port 80, right? So um, while it's technically possible to hack a data source into the Lucy configuration files, that would suck. The whole point is these task runners should be standalone portable CFCs you could just throw in a directory and execute. So they really need to have everything they need to run packed neatly inside of them. So you can declare your struct right here and you can pass it in. So this is the exact same syntax that you would use if you were to declare data sources in your application.cfc file. Um, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with that. Uh, Lucy, or actually Rilo, originally was the first engine to do that and Adobe uh, followed it a little while later. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, how the heck would I know like org dot gjt.mm, I mean, how would I know to type that, right? No worries. The easiest way to do this is to take an existing Lucy server. Right now, the CLI runs on Lucy 4, keep that in mind. Um, log into the web administrator, create a data source the way you normally would, and then go back and edit it. Um, and at the, scroll to the bottom, and there'll be some helpful text in the bottom of the screen inside of your Lucy administrator, and it'll have this struct of data in a manner you can just copy and paste uh, right out. They did that for inclusion in your application.cfc file, but you can reuse it here, um, same thing. So uh, this data source is an on-the-fly uh, declaration, 
and you can run execution. The only trick is the, um, the, the computer that's running the box binary obviously needs to have you know, network connectivity to uh, the location where the database lives. Um, oh, I must have deleted an extra slide in here. Oh, no, don't. I just have my uh, slides out of order. <laughs> okay, um, this works in most cases right here, right? Um, however, uh, and I have tickets in for this, um, there's a couple nooks and crannies of Lucy where you cannot pass in a struct yet as the data source declaration. I think it's just a few places where they just never got around to doing it. Um, and, and one of the examples I think is like the, the, the CFDB info tag, I think is one place in Lucy where you can't just pass in a struct. Um, and that's really annoying. And like I said, I have a ticket in for it. So there's a second slightly or messier but it still works um, way. And you can actually, in Lucy, again, this is a Lucy only feature, you can actually create application specific data sources on the fly. And this is a simplification of what that code would look like. Um, I'll post these slides so I won't dig into it, but basically you're grabbing the data sources out of the application settings, you're modifying it on the fly to have that same structure of information, and then you run the CF application tag action equals update. Again, this is a Lucy only feature, and you pass in the new data sources. Um, that'll create a data source on the fly, and that's your uh, escape hatch um, if you have any um, places where you just can't do that little data source to struct. Okay, directory watchers. Um, this slide is supposed to be a couple slides back, but uh, it got out of order. Um, this is a cool little feature, and it's one of the many uh, features available to your task watchers. Uh, again, it's a chainable DSL because we love chainable DSLs. Um, directory watchers allow you to create a task that will um, sit there and watch a directory and see if any file changes. And as soon as that file, or as soon as any file changes, it will run the contents of our on change closure. Uh, so in this case, we start with watch. We tell it the paths we want to watch. So this would be um, a recursive look at every CFC file starting in the working directory. Um, so here's our in directory. Uh, I can tell it I want it to pull the operating system every five seconds. And then whenever it detects a change, I want it to run this function, which outputs the text something changed, and then runs test box run, right? This would be an example of a watcher that would run your unit test for you. And then we end it with this dot start to start the watcher. Um, whenever you have a watcher and a task runner, uh, the task runner will just sit there and run indefinitely until the user hits control C, which is how you would end it. Uh, so the directory watchers are pretty cool. Those are something that are, that's built in. Um, I don't actually want to talk about recipes. I meant to take those slides out, so let's ignore them. Um, that's about my hour. Let me sh point you guys at a couple examples, um, and we can I can demo whatever you guys want to see if that's fine. Possible to watch for new files? Yeah, it'll watch for new files. It hashes uh, the directory listing, so if anything changes, including uh, timestamps, new files, deleted files, updated files, uh, it'll fire. Um, whoa not logged into here on my laptop. So if you want to see an example of some task runners um, in use, there's a website out there on the interwebs called exorcism.io. I did some screencasts about this recently. You can find on my personal YouTube account. Um, I kickstarted the uh, CFML track on exorcism uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, by the way, um, always accepting pull requests to add more exercises. This is a pretty cool site. It's, it's designed for people to come learn new languages. So if you want to learn a language, you can come over to exorcism.io. It's play on words exercise. Um, and you can, you know, click on one of these languages and you can, you know, do a bunch of exercises. It's pretty cool. It's kind of a Cohen style learning. You're given a set of failing unit tests and you have to implement a CFC until they pass. Right. Um, and so, uh, I implemented this in such a manner that students can take these um, these little exercises and they don't have to have a ColdFusion server installed, right? They don't have to have Lucy or Adobe ColdFusion or anything installed. Um, they can just do it purely from the command line, which quite frankly is how every other language on the site is implemented. It, ColdFusion really would have been the, the odd guy out if, you know, I was, if, the, if we enforced people to install a server, it would have been kind of lame. Um, so the way I did it is with task runners. Um, and I also created a series of task runners 
um, specifically designed for myself and other people who help me maintain the track um, to be able to scaffold out new exercises and uh, create readmes and things like that. Um, I, I created this all as task runners. So if we go to the, uh, ooh, we renamed it, it, used to be Cold Fusion, now it's CFML. If we go to the actual uh, GitHub repository, which stores the information on this, let me throw this into, uh, into chat real quick. Um, if we go here, uh, you can see I have a folder called tasks, and this is where I, I stuck all the task runners that I used. Um, so I have, you know, tasks that format uh, configuration files. Uh, you can see it's a pretty, pretty simple task. It, uh, it, you know, reads a file called config.json. It, you know, uses a formatter utility to, to format it, and then it writes it back out, right? Um, that's a little, just, you know, chunk of standalone functionality that I wanted to automate. We have um, uh, task runners that scaffold out exercises. So these have parameters um, and things that the user passes in. If, if they're not passed in, then I, I ask the user with the ask command to collect all the missing information. Um, and then uh, you can see I'm, you know, manipulating JSON, creating directories, using you know built-in commands like token replace um, i'm using the print helper to output a bunch of you know helpful information to the user and then i actually am turning around and i'm running other task runners from inside of this task runner you see what's going on there i'm running the task run command from inside of a task runner um, you can do anything you want so you know whenever you run this scaffold exercise task we also run the generate test task as well as a generate readme task. Um, so you can chain these things and stack them together. And these are some nice little examples of, uh, of some you know, actual real life uh, uses of these task runners. And if we look in um, one of the sample exercises, uh, like the acronym exercise, um, the way that students actually take this, uh, this exercise is they use this test runner CFC, which is a task runner. Right. Um, so all it is is a component. It has a run method. Um, it has a couple flags, and uh, you can see that I have a, a method down here that actually installs TestBox if the user doesn't already have it. Um, oh, wait, that's the run test method. Where's my? Oh, here we go. Ensure TestBox. Right. So if the, if the TestBox folder doesn't exist, then I'm running the install command, and I'm I'm installing TestBox in the current directory, and then um, I set up a, a watcher if they have it enabled. I watch the directory for CFC files to change. And when it does, I clear the screen and I run the test. Uh, in this here, this test runner, this is just pure command line execution of test box. So there's like no server started at all. It's just like directly instantiated in the test box libraries from the command line, pointing to the CFCs, running them and outputting it. Uh, so you can check out those, uh, those task runners in that exorcism repo as some uh, some real live examples of uh, of task runners and you know otherwise I probably would have had to have used you know uh, shell scripts or batch files or you know even worse some other language like Node that actually supported command line execution um, but uh, since we can do this with, with CFML via command box I was actually able to you know showcase uh, you know modern uh, command line execution of, of uh, of CFML um, in the Exorcism CFML track. Okay, well, that's my hour. Um, any other questions or anything you guys want me to demo? I didn't really do uh, too many demos, but uh, I think a lot of it's self-explanatory and I had code on the slides. Um, again, the docs for task runners, which covers everything I just talked about, is right here in our Git book. Um, you know, task anatomy, parameters, task output, all the stuff, everything I talked about times, you know, five probably is, uh, is all here in the docs, including, you know, hitting the database.